Welcome, Jörn. Thank you. Give him a good hand. Yes. Let's pray for you. Heavenly Father, we are longing for your presence. Transform our hearts so that we can hear, hear your voice and speak truly to us, Father. We ask to be here with your presence. Come, Holy Spirit, we invite you to be in the middle of us. Bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Annika. Um, good to be here back at the camp again. Um, this morning, uh, in preparation and prayer for the talks uh, here at our camp, I, I have felt uh, to uh, led to, to preach and to talk about the theme that I've been lingering around since two years back now. Um, and during this time, I, I've seen it become more and more um, into reality, both in our churches I visit uh, in Sweden. An example was this we heard from Strengness. And also how our society has changed dramatically. And I think this goes also for you as, as in the other Nordic countries. Um, I remember last autumn speaking with Fleming and Siv about this camp, uh, and just the day before we spoke uh, about planning and who to speak, and I was asked to speak, and the and, uh, day before in Malmö, 4,000 mainly Syrian refugees passed through our railway station in one day. 4,000 refugees. And I remember visiting, going down to railway station. It was a surreal experience for people with war in their eyes. Um, it was chaos. Swedes were there buying tickets to people. There was a very little organi organization. We were all caught um, in, in this moment. And, uh, and, and the war in Syria had come to our footsteps, to our doorsteps, I mean. So, and now in Europe, we have seen reaction of, we see reactions of nationalists on the rise for a long time. We have this, um, we have lost this, this election in, in UK of a Brexit, and we, we see uh, terror coming again and again in our different countries in Europe now last time in France. And there's a big conversation in our Nordic countries about identity, about culture, about economy, integration, and religion. And there's a lot of discussions and confusions. And what is really Swedish? What is really Norwegian? What's really Finnish, Danish? What's us? And the message I think from both nationalistic parties and the message from the terror is fear your neighbor. That's the demonic message, fear your neighbor. And we know what does the gospel says, church? Yes, right. Love your neighbor, that's the gospel. And Anne Applebaum, she's a columnist at uh, Washington Post, she says that the, 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 the major trend in, in the Western world now in policy uh, is white tribalism. White tribalism. We in the vineyard, we are a very pragmatic people. Our ph philosophy I uh, spoke this morning about this at our breakfast table, and that's good as long as we not fall into pragmatism or just activism. On the other hand, we also like to reflect, and that's good as long as we're not just intellectualizing everything. And we like to be, I think, in both things at the same time. We like to be 
reflective practitioners. And then we have to go back again and again, like we do on this camp. We go back to reflect and listen to each other, and we have to go back to the basics. Who is God? Who is Jesus? And uh, what is the gospel? What is the kingdom? What is the church? And what is our mission? And last night we were, were reminded about our mission in this world. In Mark's gospel, we see Jesus move from Capernaum, Tyrus, Bethsaida, Jericho, and Jerusalem. He moves from small towns and villages of Galilee. And people from larger cities come in the beginning. To, uh, and then Jesus, uh, to Jesus, uh, and on the countryside. And then Jesus comes to the city. He ends up in Jerusalem. In Acts, the church begins in the middle of a big city, Jerusalem. And then we read on how the gospel is spread uh, from, from city to city, city. The gospel is preached, church are planted, and disciples are formed until it reached Rome 40 years later and where the book ends. And it seems like there was a strategy from the Holy Spirit that the gospel will first hit cities and then uh, go into the countries. So, and also we see Paul write letters to churches in different cities like Ephesus and Corinth and other places. And in the last book of the Bible, we read how the whole fight between good and evil is a struggle between Babylon, that's a code for Rome, and Jerusalem. And Jerusalem wins, and the eternal kingdom is a new Jerusalem, Jerusalem on a new earth. And you could say that the, this tension is, uh, in the Old Testament is about the city is around uh, attention. And it's a place of security where you can come as a refugee and find cover behind the walls and gates of a city. And sometimes that is also uh, uh, used as a metaphor. In the book of Psalms, we can read that they were hungry and thirsty, Psalm 107, and the life ebbed away. They cried out to the Lord in the trouble, and he delivered them from the distress, and he led them by a straight way to a city where they could sell. The city is a place of, of security. The cities also provide human proximity, closeness between people physically. People are closer together physically, not, not uh, really in relations sometimes, but physically. You can also say that the city has a higher density Density of cultures, subcultures, um, high concentration in the city of education, art, science, in industry, commerce, technology, entertainment, sports, political power, religion. You can also say the city is great, has a great diversity. It's much more people from different ethnic backgrounds, different religions, different values, so forth. The city is a creative place where people meet with different ideas and together they create new things, create architecture, music, art. The negative part of a city, of course, is that proximity, density, diversity can easily also become a breeding ground for bad things, bad creativity. <laughs> Our city has great challenges where people lost hope in the state areas with a many God-given ability is channeled into destructive ways instead of good and upbuilding ways. And the, they live in a narrative that is parallel and very dark story. In the school I'm working, we have a lot of first generation immigrants and also second generation immigrants and we try to have people coming to motivate and we had a guy from who was born in Iran 
Farshid Jalavand. He came to Sweden when he was 17, seven, year, seven years old with his parents from Iran. He came to a state area in Malmö, in the center, and he said, I lived in three different narratives. One was in home with mom and dad from Iran. I have another one, it was out in the courtyard with the friends in my own age. And I have a third one when I come to came to school for the teachers, the Swedish teachers. It was these three worlds of narratives, I lived in them. And in, at the school, at, at my backyard, at home with my friends in my own, own age, they told me this narrative. The Swedes hate us. They will never allow us to really get into society. They will take every opportunity to, to hit us, to kill us. So he, he, he was, that was a narrative. He was, you know, was very influenced in his life. Then the local authorities, school authorities in Malmö, decided that we just would take people or pupils from different schools and just move them to, move them, move them to another area. So he came to a very white area. There were no immigrants in, his, in that school, at, and he came there. He actually believed the first day he was going to, they're going to hit me directly. I will be physically abused in this school. But instead he met people who asked him, oh, you're from Iran, tell us about your country. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. And the teachers, they, they, they started to encourage him. and said, Yalavan, you're really, you're really good. You're really, you, you, you're really good, Yalavan. You're a good pupil. So today he's, he's a, a researcher in microbiology in Lund University. And he goes around the whole, whole world, every, different countries, to lecture. And he said he challenged our pupils, our students, to change. He challenged them to change. He said, I have a Swedish passport. I choose to be a Swede. You, if you live in the wrong negative narrative, do you, have you thought about that, that, that your, you, the narrative you live in could be false? Have you thought about all the possibilities you have to study in Sweden. The government will give you a loan. You have so much opportunities. I think you make a mistake, he said, if you identify in the wrong identity, in the wrong story. Look at the possibilities. And we had a really hot discussion, I tell you. The city also in the Old Testament can be self-exalting like Babylon. And all cities want to build the Tower of Babel, symbols of how talented and powerful and successful the city is, like Burj Khalifa, Shanghai Tower, one world trade center turning torso in Malmö. You know, we want to have, you know, show how successful we are. Babel is also the symbol for the use and abuse of people, oppression and injustice in the Bible, while Jerusalem is called to be Zion, the city of peace and justice and shalom, the city that honors and worships God. Um, a really good book is Gospel-Centered Church, the Gospel-Centered Church by Tim Keller. I recommend all pastors to read that, or your leader, or everyone. It is really his reflecting book about the gospel and the church in the city. And Tim Keller says that the gospel both challenges and confirms. In, in revival traditions, we've been really good of, on what the gospel confronts in the culture. Oh, it's, this is sin, and this is sin, and this is sin. And we'll be less successful in, in really showing and, and what, what, the, what the gospel confirms, what's good, what's, what's, what's really good in the culture. I have a good friend 
His name is Markus Fritsch. He's a church planter in Gothenburg. He's from Germany. Uh, he plants a church called H2O. He told me that the German church missed the opportunity when the Turkish people came to Germany as guest workers. They, they were a very weak group. They had a hard time to establish themselves. But the church wasn't open to really connect, to invite, to include. And now he says this group in Germany is very closed and they go even deeper into the Muslim identity. But when they came, they came to Germany, the church had a great opportunity to welcome, include, and befriend them. What had happened if we had done that, he said to me. Do we want to meet our new citizens and asylum seekers? Or do we stick our heads in the sand when people from countries where missionaries have struggled for decades to establish uh, communities of faith? Where missionaries have struggled for so long time to establish the gospel? when these people are just sitting in our neighborhood. And we heard from Stengnes, I was there preaching, and there was more immigrants in the church than people from the church when I was preaching. It was amazing. And people telling stories about sitting in this little, little floating thing on the Mediterranean on the way to Greece. And they come to church and they... They don't, you know, get everything, but they, f they come back. They, f they feel welcome, they feel loved, included. Amazing to share the gospel with these people. Uh, in New Shipping, they had, long story there from there, but I short that they have, they rented a bus, take people from refugee center to coming to church. I'm so proud of what's happening in the Swedish church and what the pastors are doing. It's a great job. PM and Jeanette and the others in new shipping. And in Stockholm, I know we work with Romanian beggars and, and people, team going to refugee centers to, to meet them and to include them in the country and to welcome them. And, and uh, there's a lot of things that also in, in, in other churches happening. Those are short examples. But to me, it's obvious that the Spirit is drawing all kinds of persons to Jesus and that we as fellowship of churches are being called and drawn in to love our cities. I believe that we will in the future have more and more diversity reflected in our churches and we more and more, you know, reflecting the, the city. Now, I think in 10 years' time, this group here at the camp will be much more diverse. But for, because if we are walking with the Spirit, this is what's happening right now. For He is already there working. Let's go to Jeremiah 29. I have a Bible text. And uh, it's the letter to the exiles from Jeremiah in Babylon. And read from verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of a city to which I have carried you into, in, into exile. Pray for the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and divin divinists among you deceive you. 
do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back in this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and do not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with your, all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will bring you back from cap captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carry you into exile. In the chapter before, chapter 28, there's a false prophet, Hananiah, and he prophesies that, that, that they will be back in two years' time. And Jeremiah is kind of cool. Well, we'll see. If it happens, it's the Lord, you know. And the Lord spoke to him, no, no, two, not two years. There will be 70 years. They, <clears throat> they will plant, they will build, they get married, they have children and live as they were at home, as resident aliens. And this amazing verse 7, to seek the peace and prosperity of a city to which I have carried you with, uh, into exile. Babylon? It's very, very you know, it is noticeable as they shall bring their best to find the city's best, and they will do that unto the Lord. They should not only grow a kind of ghetto life, Jewish ghetto life in Babylon, they must commit themselves to the city's best and the city's development. That's their calling, says the Lord. For Israel, this time in, in Babylon was not just a destructive time, it was not just a distracted time under oppression. It was the time of renewal of Israel as well. When they arrived, they, they have this fresh memory of, of visual memory of a, of a temple burning and everything is over. The great symbol of a religion in flames. But in Babylon, the synagogue was developed. It started to gather that is me, the word synagogue means. They started to gather in synagogue. They began to collect the inspired texts. They, 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 they deepened their faith. Life deepened. The rabbinic, rabbinic, uh, rabbinic tradition began to emerge here. It's deepened them spiritually. And physically. This is exactly our situation, I think, and, and our task in the Nordic countries today. We are a minority in the margin as, as Christians, as a church. We are resident aliens. But we are called to grow a church that is related to the city. We are not called to grow a Christian ghetto life. We are going to multiply, to bring peace in relations, to bring God's shalom, to be constructive, bring hope, build the church, not isolate and build a cult cultivate a white tri uh, tribalistic uh, church ghetto life, or criticizing sin in society, and, but not we really want to be involved in the problems. The church that withdraw and they, that kind of church will only see the city as a kind of pond where to get fish or get saved people from. And that's not really the gospel. Unfortunately, the kind of church do, do not resonate so differently from the kids Jalavan met in Bellevue Gordon. The Christian, 
We're people, we're, we're pagans in our city. We are anti-Christ, we are anti-Christians. They hate us, so we gather here. Are you sure? Just like the immigrants who was challenged to change in our school, I think we are challenged to change in this time. We are challenged to, to look if we live in the wrong narrative, if, we, if never even trying, um, and we can live in the story of our own alienation, isolation. What, instead of asking, what can we do, Lord? What are you calling us to in this time? What, what is our true narrative? And I think we uh, often imagine this as a big, so big, big, huge task. But it isn't. It's like we heard last night. It's very basic, a very everyday life. Small choices. Little Mona and I, we decided to go to uh, a, a language cafe that's run by the city. And basically, you show up as a Swede and you're willing to speak with immigrants who want to try the Swedish we learn at school, but they know no Swede to speak to, so we don't develop the language. How hard is that calling? to go there, be nice, speak Swedish once a week. And we got to know a, a Palestinian uh, couple. So, and we said, you know, do you want to come home to us? Yeah, we like that. And when you go to someone in Sweden, you're invited, you have some flowers, maybe buy, buy a bottle of wine uh, or something for, for the host. But you know, when we came, they have bought, they came with a package this big. And, you know, it was a huge golf um, lamp, you know. You, a floor lamp, golf lamp, floor lamp. And, you know, it was over the top. You know, what do you say? And they said, we want you to remind us of us. To be reminded of us, to, to remind us that you, that you will think of us in the future. We had a great night, the Muslims, and we have great fellowship. And I think, do you know that the most immigrants have never been to a Swedish home? How, you know, just doing that, that's a great sign for those people. It's the ordinary daily life. And we can all take part in this. We are all challenged to change. It's not a huge, big thing. It's my life. Small choices. And we have an open invitation, I think, as church today in our Nordic countries. We have moved from a society where the state and the county employs and will take care of you. The system and the clear we and you. I, 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 you know, grown up in that system. Your church, you're over there, you're over there, and you do some counseling things. But you know, we take care of the real business. So be there. Now we have a situation where authorities have instructions to interact with civil society and non-government organizations in Sweden. And during this immigrant situation, this fall, actually the Swedish government said, help us. This is historic, happened in Sweden. Help us. A, a pastor who has great influence on us uh, in, uh, here at the camp is Alan Scott. For my nose, he is from Coleraine, uh, Coast by Coast Vineyard. In Ireland. And this is church that's planted on the vision of, of being the best for a city, to be to serve the city's needs. In his said, one camp he said, 
The church exists for the city. The church exists for the city. And he said, spiritual formation and city formation is the same. Our process inside with the Lord and the way, you know, society changed, it's related. I'm aiming to see a transformed city. And lately, the last one I really like, he said, God is at your work place, waiting for you to show up. God is at your workplace, waiting for you to show up. Okay. I like that. It's so easy to think and people say, oh, you know, it's, it's just a social development, how things are turning out in our cities. You know, it's a kind of autonomy. It's a thing, it's a process of rolling on by itself. But, but that's a lie. As we heard last night, it's very close to us, poverty. And we break something there. If we step out, this process is, you know, is hindered. Babylon, in all its evil, was still God's Babylon. God worked with major powers, but he doesn't look between his finger. In chapter 50, there were judgment coming to Babylon, for sure. So our word is ultimately God's world. He's Alpha and Omega. And like Luffy said, that, that Satan is God's monkey. He's, he has a chain, but God is pulling him in a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Jesus gave his life outside the walls of a city. And we are care, called to carry the life God gives us to a city. And the city from the heavenly city, if we take, think about kingdom terms. The new Jerusalem is the same as the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom, the kingdom of God that Jesus talked about. So Jesus is the different king. On the cross, God became king. The king who served and gave his life. The gospel is all about grace from God to everyone. And we are one holy, universal church. The gospel is not gnostic. It holis it's holistic. It's for everyone and for us as persons, but also our contexts, our relations, and our cities, and our countries. So if we work together, not only want to take advantage of a city, being enjoyed or being entertained, but also involved, involved in shaping the city for the city's best. If we have to do with God, we, we, we can, can't we just you know, be involved in asking him for solutions for our cities? Can't we expect that if we pray that God will speak to us? Inspire us to do things for the better, for the whole city. You know, that's, that's the vision behind healing on the streets. It's not, oh, we, you know, we're praying and have this great method. It's the vision become, how can our city be more healthy? How can our city be, be changed for the better? Yeah, by praying for people. I asked um, one of the um, authorities in our council, Milan Obradovic, his communal reward in, in Malmö. I said, how can we as a, explain this theology? And I said, how can we as a church uh, be, be useful as, for you? And he said, immediately said, promote integration. Be involved in integration. That's the biggest thing right now. 
for us. The kingdom of God is an alternative culture. And the gospel shows the world how sex, money, power can be used in non-destructive way. How social classes and ethnic groups can coexist together in church, in society, and how music, art, education, trade, industry may give people hope instead of cynicism and resignation, and criminal activities. Do we dare to believe that God still uses the church to change? Do we dare to believe that our lives, our everyday life is important, that you and I are challenged to change? That Jesus calls us, follow me. That God waits at our workplace. We need great discernment in this hour, I think. Not to listen to the false prophets of white tribalism, but to the true. To discern the true narrative from the false. Not to give in to fear, but yield to love. Finally, I will just share, I, I just le love this vision from Dream Center Church in Los Angeles. It's so simple and it's so good. Find a need and meet it. Find a hurt and heal it. Find a need and meet it. Find a hurt and heal it. I haven't said that this will be easy. It's not easy to be a multi-ethnic church. It's not easy when people with different backgrounds and traditions meet. It's not easy. But I just say, I think it's right. And I think that's what God wants. And God's gift is not easy. The gifts he gives us is not easy. But they are given to us. Let's pray. Lord, we, we pray for us in this time. We pray that you open our eyes. We pray that you give us discernment. We pray, Lord, that uh, when you challenge us, you have also the great promise that you will be with us till you come. And I pray, Lord, that you will work with us during this week. Give us time to see things in a new perspective, that you will speak to us, that you will build our faith. And that something would happen in our lives this week that have um, fruits, new fruits, for the best of our cities. And we pray for them, Lord, right now. We pray for our countries. Thank you, Lord, for loving people like you do. Help us not to get religious. Help us not to live in the false narratives. Crush them, Lord, if they are false. Please, Lord, open our eyes and give us boldness through your grace to take new steps in following you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.